thank you. Uh, it's such an honor to be here. Uh, I've, I've actually changed my title, uh, my talk to me, not so much, uh, not about liberalism and a political talk, but blockchain capital markets, because I really understand now that uh, where, what your interest is. Uh, I'll mention, if you don't know me, this is Wired Magazine, wrote about me as the scourge of Wall Street and the Bitcoin messiah. Uh, <laughs> what they, uh, I'm not the Bitcoin messiah, but I was five years ago, uh, four, or four and a half years ago, when the largest company in the world taking Bitcoin was, as I understand it, an, a diner in Australia of $800,000 a year revenue. Uh, we stepped up at Overstock and started taking it. We were a billion four. So I like to think that we saved the world about five years in coming to recognize uh, blockchain. And I did it publicly at the time. I said, really, the main event of Bitcoin is not Bitcoin. Forget Bitcoin. The main event of, Bit of Bitcoin is blockchain because there's all these institutions in society we can, we can re rebuild in a way that we can trust them more. And as you know, in some parts of the world, there's a lot of distrust of institutions these days. Uh, which brings me to the second thing, scourge of Wall Street. Uh, that's, uh, here's, how, here's how I think blockchain is going to remake Wall Street and capital markets. You know there's this issue of settlement. When we have an investor on the left, <coughs> represented by a broker-dealer, and you have a broker-dealer and you have a, a hedge fund, say, that owns some stock on the right. I use the little guy from Monopoly to illustrate the broker-dealers. And the, the people trade, the settlement, oops, the animation didn't work, but the settlement goes back and forth between the brokers. I hope this animation works. Uh, yes, when I was a child in 1969, I went to see Wall Street, and I I think my pop wanted this, me to get excited about Wall Street, but all I remember was these fellows on bicycles. And that's because Wall Street at the time, settlement was done by men on bicycles with sacks of stock over their shoulders. They were bicycling around, and that's how they did settlement. They had this very complicated system. Somebody later taught me, years later, I worked on Wall Street, and they taught me how they clip corners and all. There used to be this very complicated system. Well, in the 1960s, the volume on Wall Street quadrupled, and the folks on the bicycles log jammed. They couldn't keep up. And only old timers even remember it, but there was a three-year period where Wall Street was only open Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, and only a few hours each day so the guys on the bicycles, uh, oh, I see. So the guys on the bicycles uh, could catch up. I'm sorry, I was looking one slide off on where we are. Now I got it. Uh, so they introduced, well, the SEC got the industry together. And they said, there's two ways to solve this. And one, and the, the one that the industry actually wanted was a system of uh, electronic, direct electronic peer-to-peer -peer settlement among broker-dealers. And they organized in America, they organized, I think there were at the time about 1,200 of them, they organized into an association called the NASD. And that was 1971, and that's actually what they or why the NASD was organized, to create a force for the broker-dealers, that's what the issue was they were lobbying for, a direct peer-to-peer -peer settlement system. The SEC, instead, there was a second idea being proposed called uh, Central Security Depository with a Mobilization, and, or Central Counterparty Clearing with a Mobilization. And in this model, which had only been done once before, in the over 100 years earlier in Vienna, it had been tried. In this system, you, cr you have a central counterparty clearing group through which trades clear, and beneath that, you have a vault. And the vault is another company. In our country, it's called CDN Company. And all, so who, who here, I like to ask, raise your hand if you own any stock 
in a publicly traded company in America? Anybody? Right? All of us with our hands up, we're incorrect. We don't actually own any stock. All the stock in the United States is owned by a company no one's heard of. And I don't mean just protected or put in a vault. I mean the legal ownership is with a company called CD and Company. And then against those stock that is there, other like different, something called share entitlements are issued. And share entitlements go into the system. And as people are trading cash and stock, as people are trading stock in the American capital market, and there's a limited group of several dozen broker dealers who are directly plumbed into the DTCC. And as stock trades in the United States, what's really going on is, and actually there's another couple thousand brokers now who are connected into those first four dozen. And, and what we see of as stock trading is actually this. Stock isn't trading. All the stock is immobilized in a, in a central counterparty clearing system. It's immobilized. It, it's made. It's not so it's moving. It's in one vault. And again, I don't just mean the paper. I mean the legal ownership actually stays with them. And then these other contractual claims are all that really trade. Uh, now, the SEC in 1971 went with this model because they said the technology for direct counter uh, clearing, peer-to-peer uh, -peer electronic clearing was not ready. And they made this, uh, so they, they, they got the industry, they really forced this on the industry. It just so happens that the first head of the, of the NASD he was a nice fellow from Ohio. He was a neighbor of mine, and I knew him when I was 13, and he actually taught me about some of this stuff. It was really quite uh, an irony. Well, the great economist Milton Friedman said that nothing is so permanent as a temporary government solution. And in this case, this temporary government solution in 1978, the SEC said, okay, we're going to make this permanent. And in 1986, they did their own study. It's been kind of lost to history, called the Pollock Report, where they analyzed this, and a fellow analyzed it, a very respected, I think it was a reformer judge, and he described all kinds of problems in this system. And those problems came to light. And in 2008, part of what happened in 2008 was that this system collapsed. This system froze, and it froze to me, it's, it's problematic in many ways. One is there are, the, there's the, because there is fault tolerance in the system, the system can generate more shares of stock that are underlying actually in the company. That's a problem. It means that you can't, there's other problems, corporate voting, for example, and opportunities for manipulation, and most importantly, systemic risk. Systemic risk, this is, has huge opportunities for systemic risk, which is actually what uh, happened in 2008. And it's been kind of forgotten to history, but when Alan Greenspan was called out of retirement to come and explain to Congress in October of 2008 what's going on, he said something people have kind of forgotten. There are additional regulatory changes that this breakdown of the central pillar of competitive markets requires in order to return to stability, particularly in the areas of fraud, settlement, and securitization. You know, the, whole, the whole world remembers the fraud, Bernie Madoff, and with securitization, that's mortgage-backed securities and such. But what be, people forget is what actually triggered the crisis on, 2000, on September 15, 2008, was exactly what I just said. The settlement system froze. Nobody knew who they could trade with anymore. And I think that that, that alone is reason enough to consider a new system. Uh, I'll also point out there's a particular issue that, uh, that makes this especially uh, dangerous. And the particular issue is uh, this is how short selling is supposed to work. A pension fund custody stock with a prime broker. The prime broker generates a locate for a short seller and charges for it. There's surprisingly little in the system. 
or there was the case in 2008, there was ver surprisingly little in the system to keep the prime broker from telling, he may have just had you know, one block of shares and telling one short seller, uh, you have a locate so you can short sell, and, and telling that to multiple short sellers and giving them more, and that's part of the process that generated, as I described a minute ago, that red cloud could be bigger than the underlying stock. That was part of the, it turns out to be just one of those issues that was letting that happen. I'm happy to say I think it's, that's been much tightened up on where it was. Uh, and the SEC, I used to have a lot of beefs with the SEC, but I think that it's a different, a different SEC these days. And I've been happy to learn in the last couple of years how that pop problem uh, has been redressed. But that actually creates the market for what I'm going to show you even bigger. Uh, so, just a moment. Okay, we can we can replace just about everything I just showed you with a ledger. And by a ledger, I mean imagine we were doing a very simple transaction of the old man has some, some cash and he wants to buy a baseball glove from the other fellow. You could have the money, imagine a ledger. And when I explain Bitcoin in the United States, I explain blockchain. This is the example I use to really simplify it for people. That imagine you had a book like my grandfather ran a hardware store out of, or a bar out of actually, that, uh, and that just one of those big ledgers uh, and that you could reduce money to that form, and the, form, and the, and the ledger was cryptograph cryptographically protected and public and transparent. You could reduce transactions to just e ledger e entries in the ledger, book entries in the ledger. That same, we all understand that, of course, for Bitcoin. The same thing can be done with stock, where we create, have forms of money and stock in a ledger, and the act of settlement for stock can just be writing and, and erasing and writing coins within a ledger. You could take this whole system and replace it. And interestingly, Bob Greifeld, the former CEO and chairman of NASDAQ, said a few months ago, uh, in, he said 100% of the stocks and bonds being issued on Wall Street today could be issued as tokens, and in five years, 100% of the stocks and bonds will be issued as tokens. That means that the entire plumbing of Wall Street is going to uh, be deprecated, is going to be made unnecessary over the next five years. And uh, it's not just a theory anymore. We have been doing this. We've actually, I think, been maybe... Uh, more advanced than people know, or people may forget everything we've done here. But for example, in early 2015, Overstock, the parent company that I started, an American retailer, used its money to buy a node on Wall Street. Because I did not want anything to do with like a Mt. Gox situation. I'm not trying to get around the law. I wanted to be right in the middle of the, of the law. And I got a real law firm and I bought a piece of Wall Street, my company bought a piece of Wall Street that was already SEC registered, or an SEC registered broker dealer uh, with an SEC compliant trading platform, an, an ATS. And it already trades two and a half to three percent of the order flow of the US capital market flows through it. So we bought this and we went to the SEC and said we would like to uh, Block, turn this into a blockchain trading platform. They gave us deemed approval on April 1st, 2015. We, so what they gave us approval to do was what I just showed you, to do that with a, with a uh, uh, US security, to do that on a SEC compliant platform. We then issued the world's first private blockchain security in August of 2015. And it was a tiny bond $5 million bond. We did it with a firm called First New York, and it was just to prove the system worked. We, we issued it, and we actually bought it back six months later. It was a $5 million bond, which is very small on American scale, 
And it was really like, you know, the man who invented the polio vaccine, Jonas Salk. Everyone was afraid to take it. And so he actually went on television and gave it to himself. That's what we did. The parent company, as T0 develops these cool technologies, the parent company is there and is always the first to use it. Uh, we, so after issuing the world's first private blockchain security, we applied six months later to the SEC to issue the world's first public blockchain security. We applied in December 2015, uh, the first public blockchain security, and it took a year. But after a year, they declared it deemed effective. That means they say you are now, you can legally sell this to the public. And we put out the world's first public blockchain security. Sometimes people forget this, that there's actually one blockchain, public blockchain security that I know of in the world. It's actually been out there for 15 months. Uh, it's OSTKP, and that's a ticker symbol of an SEC compliant. You can look up the S3, it trades, you can get the, uh, you know, that's, that's a public blockchain security. It's actually been trading for 15 months, public per all the laws and regulations of the United States. So, uh, we have also created a product to address that issue of, of, of stock locates regarding short selling where we replace the system as it exists and we have, we use our ATS to host an overnight auction to generate those locates that support short selling and we actually give 80% of the proceeds, it gets sent back to the beneficial owner. I believe this is, this has the potential to be extremely disruptive to something that's really the bulk of prime brokerage revenue in the United States. Now, it's risky, and of course, as with all these things, I don't mean to oversell it. I mean, we, we think that the potential uh, for disruption here is people are just beginning to comprehend it. I'm not talking about just this product. I'm talking about across blockchain capital markets, but actually more than that. So as an overall picture, on the, on the left, you see this is the company that we bought uh, as it exists on Wall Street. And we can both pipe it into the current world of blockchain, like GDAX and Gemini and Poloniex and such, and be the bridge between the conventional world and the new world. But we also have developed a, we have a security token trading platform. And this is, there's, I believe, there's precisely one of these in the world, a trading platform that is both technologically set up to handle blockchain, and secondly, is SEC compliant. And this is SEC compliant, and it has been for three years. Actually, we just had our three-year anniversary. We can legally trade blockchain instruments here, and we did so. And it's, we did a private blockchain two and a half years ago, and we did a public one uh, 15 months ago. So. Uh, we think, I mean, that is unique. It's the only intersection of those two sets in the world. It is an SEC-compliant trading venue that technologically is geared for blockchain. So that is T0, and I left 11 minutes here in the hopes that we could maybe take some questions. Thank you. Hold on, sorry. Uh, any questions, please? We've got one right here. Gentleman hello, over there. Uh, hello, please. Mr. Bernstein, thank you very much for a lovely presentation. Uh, I guess the first question is, you know, you said you've, it's been three years since you, uh, you know, you're, you're now compliant for three years with a platform that can issue securities, uh, crypto, crypto securities that are SEC compliant. Mm -hmm. What has stopped the market from going into that platform and issuing more stuff? So why is the, the issuance not picked up? Or is it something that, uh, you know, is there a plan? Do you have a roadmap? And is that something that is going to plan? Well, I know it must look like we're making slow progress. I view it sometimes like the guy with an icebreaker who goes out to the Arctic ice field and is crawling through, looks, you know, he's burning a lot of fuel for every kilometer he makes. And, you know, it's very expensive what we're doing. We're sort of doing, you know, a, a lot of things 
that are regulatory, that because of regulations are expensive to be the first one through. So all that said, you know, it took us until, it took us a full year just working to get permission to do our blockchain security. And we, we built our own functionality and so on and so forth. And so we did it. It came out in January of 2016. Well, that's, it was really May of last year of, of uh, no, it came, out of Jan it came out in January of 2017. So that's the only, that's when we were technologically and our system was ready technologically in a way that the SEC approved of that we could even do that once. Then uh, last year, ERC-20, uh, I, well, I don't know when it get, first got coded, but everybody started hearing about ERC-20 last year and it made the ICO craze possible. And I guess I look at the ICO craze, or I shouldn't say craze, but the ICO boom, I looked at it and I thought at least 90% of it looked like it was designed to evade the law. It looked like it was designed, you know, since the 19, we used to have in the United States, people driving around in station wagons with stacks of penny stock certificates in their back seat, selling them out and to, to grandmas, to stealing their farms and stuff, swindling people. So in 1933, the U.S. decided that if you're going to sell securities, if you're going to raise capital from the public, you have to do it in a way that meets certain government standards and you have to jump through certain hoops. And the ICO craze, the utility token explosion last year, and I'm here with friends who I know are, were big in that field and they've known and, I, and, I, and they know how I have felt about it and how I feel about it that, I mean, they, they kept things good. I know, I know it's very big here in Asia as well. I have a lot of doubts about that because the way that they got designed in many, many cases seemed like people were just designing it so they could get around the rules so they could go out to the public and raise capital on the expectation of doing something for people with it. And it seemed really it seems sketchy to me that of how they were trying to get around, like they were trying to get around the law. And I think that that was uh, bad and bad for our movement. I don't think it will be remembered. Uh, I don't think it will be remembered fondly in a few years, especially, you know, some of those coins are going to do well, but a lot of them are going to fare badly. So that whole utility token movement, to me, uh, was a diversion. And it, it happened in the U.S. And the U.S. last July, July 25th, the SEC came out and ruled and said, you know, one of these was DAO was clearly a security token. Now, a month ago, the current SEC chairman said, the truth is I've never seen a utility token that wasn't really a security token. And then I heard just this morning they finally charged two people and they're really going, they're going to start going after people. That means I think you're going to see that whole utility token boom of last year. Either, I think you're going to see it all shift into, or overwhelmingly shift into, into security tokens. Well, if it shifts from, in fact, we're getting away from the word ICO. We're calling out what we're doing security token offerings as opposed to initial coin offerings and, or utility coin offerings. And... I think that what you saw, at least in the United States, you won't see that utility token thing continue. You will see it shift to security tokens and people will start following the regs, uh, which I think is a good thing. And I think that not, not, I thought that anyway, but it just so happens that if that prediction proves correct, and the truth is I think you'd have to be crazy in the United States to come out with a utility token at this point. When you raise capital in a way that violates the SEC rules about how you raise capital, they have the right to come in 20 years later and just unwind everything you've done and close everything down and give the money back however they see fit. I mean, you are just, you're, someone is nuts if they're doing that in the United States now. Everything you build becomes susceptible to being taken away 20, 30 years later. So I think that you're going to see the legitimate fundraising shift to security tokens. If it does, those tokens need a place that can handle and something that is both a trading platform that is technologically capable of handling a security and that is SEC compliant. And as I said, there's precisely one of those in the world, and it's T0. <coughs> so five minutes, I can get through uh, maybe another one, question. Maybe one more question? One or two more, yeah. We can take one more if there's anybody. 
Going once. Going twice. We have someone over here. Oh, we've got a gentleman over there. Thank you. Thank you. I, I want to ask uh, how to define the utility token and the security token. And if we go to the uh, security token ICO in the future, do you think the process will be same as the utility token ICO? <coughs> Great. What's the difference between utility token and security token? Well, there is a legal test called the Howey test, if you want to know how they decide in the United States. <coughs> but think of it this way. If somebody, you know, there was a video, last time I was in Japan, which I, was too many years ago, I remember these great video arcade parlors. Imagine somebody opened a video, they came to town and they say, imagine if they open a video arcade parlor and they sold, they took a million dollars worth of those little brass uh, tokens you get and uh, let's say I'm the guy who's opened this video parlor. I come out and I sell to the townspeople, here's a million dollars worth of these tokens. I'll sell them for $700,000 just to get, as a promotion, people get your million dollars worth of tokens and now you can come in and start using the machines. You can see that all I've done is I've accelerated some revenue. I have some deferred revenue. I have some, de I, I have a, it's, a, it's looked at as revenue. But suppose, and so, to the, so people started selling utility tokens, in part kind of making that, ar well, making that argument that it had that same characteristic. We're just selling these tokens that have a utility and we're selling them at a discount to people who will be able to use them. To which another answer or another analysis is, wait a second, if, if I did what I just said and came and built a video arcade parlor and sold you a million dollars worth of tokens for 700,000 and you can use them today, that's one thing. But if I come to you and if I came and I did that and I didn't build the video arcade parlor, I sold the million dollars worth of tokens for 700,000 and then I use that to go and buy the machines and build an arcade, well, the argument, the other analysis is that's, that's very close to a I'm t uh, that's like a security in the following way. I'm taking capital from you now and, and you're giving it in the expectation of some future, f uh, future benefit. And so, anyway, I consider that dancing close enough to the line, I don't want to find out. And the, so to me, that's when people are doing things like that, I think that we can make a bunch of what we call in America Philadelphia lawyer arguments about, well, that's not really a security, that's a utility, that's not. But to me, that's close enough. I don't want anything to do with it. So we, so I think that anything that involves U.S. investment and U.S. trading, you're going to see, uh, and do you mind if I go back, if I put my, if you put my slide up, I want to refer to a slide. Just a, uh, you know, all this stuff, I got to point out, all this stuff, over here, so there have been a bunch of coins issued, utility coins issued in the last year, and a bunch of them are trading over here. If the SEC determines that a coin has traded over here that actually was a security, the liability is unbelievable. The liability, uh, nobody, you can't, it means, to be honest, it means everybody's broken the law. Now, I don't, I don't mean, I, I'm, I, I know these guys, GDAX and Polonix and stuff, Gemini, Kraken, nobody would break the law or wants to break the law, and I hope that if something like this happens, the SEC is reasonable. But let me point out that these hundreds and hundreds of tokens over here, the SEC has the right to come in this year, five years from now, anything they want, and say, actually, that was actually, like, that was a security. And not only did the company break the law, but everybody who touched that, is, has liability. Everybody who traded that, not on a US compliant, not on a, an exchange that was compliant with the SEC, uh, you know, conceivably could be in trouble. I hope they're not in trouble. The point is, we're creating a system that, that we're taking this thing, we started, we bought something that was SEC reg registered and FINRA compliant and SEC compliant, and we made it blockchain. So we know that we know that we are inside that line by 
uh, a, good, uh, a good bit. So listen, once again, in closing, it has been a real honor to come and speak to you. Thank you.